give God the highest praise. He deserves the highest praise. It's all about Him. There is nothing that Clay Dyer and I can do without the love of the Father. There is nothing you can do without the Spirit that dwells within us today. It's all about Him. It's nothing about us. Where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is freedom. I asked the praise team to stay up here this morning because God was showing me this. This morning in our 8 o'clock service, I talked about how God uses me to give a vision over a church or a prophetic word many times to churches we go to. And he showed me that there was a lot of depression and anxiety and that the depression was even trying to ruin family units. And as I was sitting there this morning, if you notice, I used to be a worship leader. So it's hard for me to sit down. But God said, sit down. And when the master speaks, I listen. So I sat down and I began to pray. And he showed me this. He said, I want them to form elbow to elbow this morning. And if you're not comfortable, you can just do a little side bump. Whatever you're comfortable with. But you join hands or you join elbows. And I want them to go back into he turns chains. Into what? What did he say? What's he say? He turns those graves into gardens. Graves into gardens. He turns, he takes ashes and turns to beauty. And you know how I know that? I had not one but two abusive relationships. And then along comes two hours later at a bass fishing tournament, my clay dyer. God takes ashes and turns to beauty. And the word that was ringing in my spirit this morning that I was sitting there is freedom, freedom, freedom. So I want you this morning as loud as you can to the Father. I want you anything that's holding you back today, anything that's binding you or binding your home or your family, I want you to break that chain by breaking those elbows and declaring freedom this morning. I'm going to count to three and those things that have been holding you back, today they are going to be loose. And if you need to run to this altar, you run and lay it down this morning. One, two, three. Freedom! Freedom! Hallelujah! Freedom! You turn morning to that thing. into freedom you turn beauty for ashes you turn shame into glory you're the only one who can you turn chains into freedom you turn You're the only one who cares. You alone, God, you're the only one. You're the only one we need. Only to you something else. Clay knows when I get started that I get wound up when the anointing hits and he's good with it. We say, let God have his way. 
Yeah. There are people in the very presence of God because we are in his presence right now and you are on this side of the room. And there is a shame that the enemy is trying to put in you saying, if I go down there, people are going to look at me. Honey, let them look. Because you know what? God is the only thing that matters. He is the only thing that matters. Run to him. Run to him. Run to him. He's all that matters. I've heard Clay tell the story about when he got saved and he thought he was having heart attack symptoms and he was sitting in a seat and he was shaking. I've heard my dad tell the story of when he was addicted to alcohol, pain pills and gambling and he was shaking. He was holding on to the back of a pew, Pastor. He was shaking, holding on because you know what? That old flesh don't want to let go, does it? Woo! But when God comes in, see that tugging that you're feeling this morning, that tugging that's washing over you, that's God, honey, that's God. And he's wanting to clean you up. He's wanting to take the depression away. Let him have it. And we will meet you there. You'll have saints of God around you. I'm going to tell you something. If I had it to go back and do over, and Clay Dyer will tell you the same thing. I wouldn't hold the back of no seat. I would be out here dancing and rejoicing and praising Him. He is worthy. Amen. One more time. We're going to shout freedom. And those people that they feel like that they can't let go. I'm trusting, I'm declaring over this house today that they will leave change. One, two, three. Freedom! Hallelujah! Freedom! Woo! Hope ain't none of y'all got any fried chicken you about to go eat because it's dead, okay? That fried chicken will wait, amen? I'm going to try not to hold you very long, but I'm about to preach myself happy. I'm blessed with a beautiful bride, and y'all, y'all got to see the fireball then. Most times, most time she'll turn it loose, but most times uh, she bridles it a little bit. She turned it loose then, y'all got to see it. And I got to say this morning, Lord help, I don't even know where to start. I got so many things to praise. But uh, brother, over in the front corner, what's your name? Yes, sir, are you? Yes, sir. Willie? Willie, I want you to know that God led me, led my eyes to you this morning, first thing. Watching you worship. Brother, I appreciate your obedience. I appreciate your obedience. Let me tell you something. You bless somebody, and it was me. You keep your obedience. You keep praising. You keep blessing. And you better watch out because God's about to blow your doors off, son. You understand? Like Pastor Brian told Drew or told somebody, he said, you better watch out what you ask for. Told Mike that. Let me tell you something. God's word don't say it for no reason when he says, Believe in what you ask for in prayer and believing you will receive. Let me tell you something. Take your seatbelt off and let God carry you for the ride that only he can. Take your seatbelt off and let God empower you and let him take control of you. He will take you places and he will, he will heal you. He will restore you. He will break the depression. He will break the things that the devil tries to put in your life and slow you down and steal your joy. But he can all, the devil can only do it if you let him. Don't you let him. You let God. Before I go any further this morning, my mind is, my memory is like my finger. It's not very long. And I'll tell you right now, when my wife tells me, baby, remember so-and-so? I say, honey, let me forget something else because my mind is full. I've got two men in here that we're fixing to bless. 
It's a great little devotional book. It's called Experiencing the Father's Love by O.S. Hillman. Before I go any further with this, after service, there's a merchandise table out back. Some of y'all saw it when you come in. My precious wife finds this Christian um, material and uh, some jewelry. I don't even know what all she's got. It's almost gone, excuse me. But what's left, we will be glad to work with you. We, we take credit cards, debit cards, checks. Uh, we even take cash. And I will just be honest with you, the proceeds go to feed the hungry, the Dyer family. Amen. <laughs> it took y'all about three seconds to get there, but y'all got it, didn't you? Actually, it goes, to, it goes to help us down the road so we can tell other people about Jesus. Amen. Yeah. The way we're going to win this, we're going to do a little Bible trivia real quick. I heard somebody say, oh, Lord. Yeah. We're going to find out. Y'all been reading y'all's word. Amen. I'm going to start out easy for the first one. Then we're going to get a little bit harder. If there's a man in here that can tell me what Genesis 1 1. Pastor, if I didn't love you so much, I'd tell you that was cheating. Come on up, brother. For all you've done for me, this is the least I can give you this week. Love you too, brother. Now then. Who can tell me of a man? If you can't get this one, we're going to do some serious praying. John 3.16. I'm sorry I ain't got eight books. We got about ten people giving answers up here. <laughs> but the first one I heard was Brother Mike. Come on up, brother. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you, brother. Yes, sir. Love you too, brother. Guys... If I get into this, I'm going to be bawling like a baby. But I can't help it. We've been to churches all across the nation, Canada, Mexico. I'm blessed in my, in my pastoral contacts to have roughly 800 churches we've been blessed to go into and minister. Of those 800, there are those that you know you will, will become a family You'll have a, a brotherly connection, a family connection. As I told this out, they stuck with us for life. There's, I dare to say, maybe a dozen of those 800 that get it. That know how it's done. That know how it should be done. That shepherd their flock. That you can tell when you go in there, they're a mighty house of God. You feel God's presence. Just like a mighty Russian wind hits you right square in the face when you walk in and you don't want to leave. And you know they're going to be family. You meet those that there's a handful of them that you know. People will say, I'm praying for you. I'm praying for you here every day. You know when they say it, but you know when they do it. This church right here does it. I cannot thank Brother Mike, Brother Drew, uh, Brother Brian. I cannot thank y'all enough for the honor of allowing us to come in, allowing us to be obedient. Brother, thank you for the freedom to be obedient. Thank y'all for your love. And like I said, you stuck with me. I just hope you like it. If you don't, it's just tough, brother. Because you can't get rid of me. Y'all have spoiled us absolutely rotten. I have been taking notes. And for any other church that calls to book us, I'm going to say, call Elkhorn Baptist Church. This is the criteria. I love y'all. But this is the criteria. For those of y'all that go here regularly, I'm sure y'all already know that. But I can't tell you how, I'm just going to be real, guys. That's all the way I know to be, is real and blunt, and I tell it like it is. I don't know if I've ever been in a Baptist church. Y'all ain't Baptist here. It may. I don't say that. With all due respect, I don't say that knocking Baptist. Jesus saved Baptist, Methodist, Church of Christ, you name it. 
Church of God. Now, I'll tell you this right now, brother. Like I said, it may say Baptist Church on your sign. This is a church of freedom that loves God. I can't tell you how refreshing it is to come into a worship service where people are hungry and thirsty to be in God's presence. There is no words to put it. All I can say is give God a hand clap of praise. That's all I can say. With that being said, dear Jesus, it's 1134. I'm glad the chicken is dead. No, I'm just kidding. Guys, ladies... I want you to know, God created every one of you, every one of you, every one of you, every one of you, every one of us. God created us not to be ordinary, but to be extraordinary. God created all of us, one body, one unit, for one accord, for a time that we are in right now. If you have never opened your Bibles, if you watch the news for about 3.5 seconds, and you flip over to the book of Revelations, just read the book of Revelations, and you will see. If you don't believe God's coming back, brother, I love you, sister, I love you, but you better crawl out from that rock you under. You better understand that God wants to bless you. God wants to empower you. God wants us to turn loose of the control that we as humans like to have. But when you get in God's presence, you don't care if you have control. When you get in God's presence, you don't care about a watch. You don't care about Facebook. You don't care about a phone. All you want to be is basket in His presence and letting Big Daddy God Love on you. Because let me tell you something. It's the best place a man or a woman can be. Is be a child of God. And to serve Him. You may be in here this morning. And you may think that you're stressed. You may think that you're depressed. You may think that, you, that you're overwhelmed. You may think that you're facing an adversity that you can't beat. Well I'm fixing to tell you brothers and sisters how to beat it. And it's very simple. We serve a simple God. And I don't say that to belittle Him. God makes it simple. We as Christians make it complex. We as Christians make it confusing and difficult. God is a simple God. But an almighty God. That can conquer and can bring Complex issues to a halt in your life. It's up to you, up to us, to let him do it. My question to you, are you going to let him today? Are you going to let him tomorrow? Me and my wife aren't naive and dumb enough that when we come in a place, we hope and we pray that we get to come back in God's time. But we're not stupid enough not to realize that some of y'all, this will be the first, last, and only time we will be in front of you. Until we hope and pray we see you in heaven when God calls us home. If you wonder why I'm bold, if you wonder why I'm transparent, if you wonder why I preach it like it is, if you wonder why I love you, it's because Jesus called me and I love serving my big daddy God. If you wonder why I'm like I am, it's because I know that God has called me. God has called me to be a fisher of men. God has called me to tell you the truth. God has called me not to come in here, tickle your ears, make you feel good, get you all fired up, and not tell you the truth about a relationship with Jesus, and just to get you fired up and, and, and jamming and rocking, and go out there and let the devil chew you up two or three days from now when I'm not in here, and let you bust the gates of hell wide open. God has called me to bring me in here to preach the truth to you, to understand what he can do for you. God has called me in here to tell you that he can empower you. Are you going to let him empower you? What comes with empowerment? Victory. 
What comes with empowerment? Love. What comes with empowerment? Forgiveness. What comes with empowerment? Courage. What comes with empowerment? Confidence. Confidence in what? Confidence in God. If you got your Bibles with you, turn with me real quick to Luke chapter 5, starting in verse 1. Luke chapter 5, verse 1. When you get there, just say amen or hallelujah. Luke chapter 5, verse 1. I still hear a few turning. Luke chapter 5, verse 1. Here we go. One day as Jesus was preaching on the shore of the Sea of Galilee, great crowds pressed in on him to listen to the word of God. He noticed two empty boats at the water's edge. For the fishermen had led them and were washing their nets. Stepping into one of the boats, Jesus asked Simon, its owner, to push it out into the water. So he sat in the boat and taught the crowds from there. Verse 4. When he had finished speaking, he said to Simon, Now, go out where it is deeper. And let down your nets to catch some fish. Master, Simon replied, we worked hard all last night and didn't catch a thing. But if you say so, I'll let down the nets again. And this time, their nets were so full of fish, they began to tear. A shout for help brought their partners in the other boat. And soon both boats were filled with fish and on the verge of sinking. That's the God I serve. When Simon Peter realized what had happened, he fell to his knees before Jesus and said, Oh, Lord, please leave me. I'm too much of a sinner to be around you. For he was awestruck by the number of fish they had caught, as were the others with him. His partners, James and John and the sons of Zebedee, were also amazed. Jesus replied to Simon, Don't be afraid. From now on, you'll be fishing for people. And as soon as they landed, they left everything and followed Jesus. Let us pray. Father God, we praise you, we love you, we thank you for how awesome and incredible you are. Father, we praise you that you're a miracle-making, chain-breaking, depression-whipping, almighty God. Father, we praise you that when we speak your name, at your name, the power in your name, the devil has to bow. We praise you when we speak your name, victory comes in. We praise you that when we praise your name, we can all have love, peace, strength that we never knew existed. Father, I pray this morning that if there's one soul in this room, that doesn't know you as their Lord and Savior. That Father, they could not leave this room. Before they have that relationship. Father, I praise you this morning. That you empower us. Father, to accomplish. And Father, just to, just to be victorious. And Father, you deserve all of our praise and glory. For what you've already done. And for what you're going to do. For it's in Jesus' name we pray and we ask these things. And all God's people said, Amen. Amen. When you're a child of God, when you serve God. Let me back up. When you're a child of God, it ought to be your utmost passion and desire to serve Him. As a Christian, it ought to burn in your heart. To try to find any lost soul around you. And witness. Tell them about Jesus. And I know what you're thinking right now. You're sitting back going. You don't have any idea what they're into. You don't have any idea how hard it is. They won't believe me. They want to call me a Jesus freak. They want to call me a holy roller. They want to say I'm nuts. Let me tell you something brother and sister. If they watch what they want to do. Count it an honor. Count it an honor. 
You know why? Because they see something different in you. They see something different in you because you're not of the world. You keep living it in front of them. I love how my father-in-law put it to me before he went home to be with heaven. Be, to be in heaven with Jesus. One of his last words to me on his deathbed before he crossed over. He looked at me and he said, son, he said, go preach the gospel and use words when necessary. Let me tell you something. You can talk a whole lot, but people watch your actions. You can talk all day long. I like to say it like my granddaddy, you said, he said, you can talk all day long, but it takes money to buy groceries, baby. But let me tell you something. You can talk all day long, but when you live it in front of them, when you live it in front of them, they will look up, they will pay attention. They may think you're nuts and crazy because they're under conviction, but keep on keeping on. Let me tell you, I had a friend of mine, I didn't share this in the first service, but God laid it on my heart during this service. He didn't last time. So I know somebody in here needs this. First of all, let me go real quick. Follow me to Exodus. I don't got ahead of myself here in my notes. Follow me to Exodus chapter 4. Exodus chapter 4. Exodus chapter 4, verse 1. Signs of the Lord's power. But Moses protested again. What if they won't believe me or listen to me? What if they say the Lord never appeared to you? Then the Lord asked him, What is that in your hand, Moses? A shepherd's staff, Moses replied. Throw it down on the ground, the Lord told him. So Moses threw down the staff, and it turned into a snake. Moses jumped back. Then the Lord told him, reach out and grab its tail. So Moses reached out and grabbed it, and it turned back into a shepherd's staff in his hand. Perform this sign, the Lord told him. Then they will believe that the Lord, the God of their ancestors, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob, really has appeared to you. Then the Lord said to Moses, now put your hand inside your cloak. So Moses put his hand inside his cloak. And when he took it out again, his hand was white as snow with a severe, severe skin disease. The Lord commanded Moses, now put your hand back into your cloak, the Lord said. So Moses put his hand back in. And when he took it out again, it was as healthy as the rest of his body. The Lord said to Moses, if they do not believe you and are not convinced by the first miraculous sign, they will be convinced by the second sign. If they don't believe you or listen to you even after these two signs, then take some water from the Nile River, pour it on the dry ground. When you do, the water from the Nile will turn to blood on the ground. But Moses pleaded with the Lord. O oh Lord, I'm not very good with words. I've never been, I have never been, and I'm not now, even though you have spoken to me. I get tongue-tied and my words get tangled. Then the Lord asked Moses, Who makes a person's mouth? Who decides whether people speak or do not speak, hear or do not hear, see or do not see? Is it not I, the Lord? Now go, I will be with you as you speak, and I will instruct you in what to say. Don't come to me and look at me and say, This person is not going to listen to me. I don't know what to say. I get nervous. I understand you may get nervous. You know what that nervousness is? You're doing what you're supposed to do. Because when you get anxious and you get nervous, it's because it means something to you. God will never call you where God will not equip you. And God will never call you where he won't empower you. There was a guy that I grew up with, about six years older than myself. We became friends when I was in high school. He lived about 20 miles from me. His name was Alan. This was the story I was referring to. Alan's father-in-law was a Baptist minister, preacher. When Alan and I, we used to hang out before I knew Jesus. We would hang out, fish on Sunday, hunt on Sunday, just be heathens while his wife took his kids and went to church. When I got saved, 
Alan called me about three days after I got saved. I never told him, but he called me. He says, brother, I want to congratulate you. I said, for what? I ain't won no fishing tournament. He said, no. He said, I want to congratulate you that you've done something most people won't do. He said, you allowed God in your heart and you got saved. I said, brother, I sure did. He said, buddy, I want you to know something. He said, while I'm proud of you, he said, please don't talk about God around me. He said, I respect what you believe. He said, but I'm tired of getting preached to. Please don't talk about God around me. I told him, I said, Alan, I love you. I said, but I want you to understand something. You can't stop me from praying for you. He started cussing me, cursing me. Talked to me like a dog, just like what Goliath talked to David before David slayed him. I didn't go slay Alan, I promise you. But what I did do, every time when I was around him, when we would fish or we would hunt on a Saturday or other days of the week, I would just try to talk to him and love on him. I noticed his countenance started to change. I noticed every time he would use a, use a vulgar word, he would look at me and say, I'm sorry. I'd say, brother, you don't apologize to me. So every time he started saying a vulgar word around me, when he'd say one, I'd say, praise the Lord. A few minutes later, he'd say another, I'd say, praise the Lord. Well, he got aggravated one day while we were in the boat, and he broke a bait off, and he went to cursing. I said, praise the Lord, 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 praise the Lord. He looked at me and said, why in the world do you say praise the Lord every time I cuss? I said, brother, because I love you, and I want you to realize how often you're doing it. He looked at me. He said, hmm, well, we rocked on there for a couple of years. I noticed his countenance was starting to change. I never took the Bible like a sledgehammer and tried to beat him over the head. I did like, I tried to do what I thought Jesus would do, and that was love on him and be a brother. Love on him. When he cussed me like a dog, I loved on him. When he told me I was crazy, I loved on him. I prayed for Alan every day for eight years. I don't say that to pat myself on the back. Hang on, listen. After eight years of praying, I went and did a wild game dinner on a Thursday night, ministered, God moved, led several people to the Lord. I got back that Thursday night. I was at home on Friday afternoon. Alan was a truck driver. Alan called me about 2 o'clock one Friday afternoon and said, Brother, are you home? I said, Yes, sir, I just got here. He said, Can I come talk to you? I said, Brother, absolutely. It took Alan about 20 minutes to drive from his house to my house. And he said, Brother, I'm on my way. When I hung up the phone, I immediately started praying. And I said, God, please give me the words to say. Because I feel like this is my chance to lead him to the Lord. Alan pulled up in my driveway, pretty much slinging gravel, coming there on two wheels. And the first I thought I had was, oh, Lord, he is mad about something. Praise God. This is how God works. He threw open his door, threw his car open in part, never turned the car off. Almost slipped and fell because he was trying to run to me. And as he ran to me down my driveway, he said, I got saved. I got saved. I got saved. I got saved. When the power of God gets all over you, you don't care who looks, you don't care what they say, and you don't care what they think. Alan jumped on me, we bear hug, we slung snot, we slung tears. We had a hallelujah, buffalo, neck jerking fit, throw down. He looked at me when he leaned back. He looked me right in the eyes. And you know what he said? Brother. Thank you for loving me enough that when I cussed you, when I cussed you, when I defiled you, thank you for loving me enough to pray for me and not give up on me. Might not have been a first, might not have been a second, might not have been a third, just like with Moses. But I just kept on with that. I love it when people come to me 
<laughs> when I'm witnessing to them, I love it when they look at me and they say something like, brother, with all due respect, you're, you're wasting your time on me. I love it when they look at me and say, brother, with all due respect, I'm an atheist. You know why I love it? Because I know where we stand. You know why I love it? Because I take it on as a challenge. I take it on as a game time deal. I take it on because when you're a child of God, that's your battlefield. That's your mission field. And let me tell you something, brothers and sisters. I told this to them last night. If you were here, you heard this. If you have pets, we have a Labrador Retriever. Her name's Cherry. She's half lab, half hound, and a quarter, three-eighths, whatever half of I have no idea what. We rescued her. She is our little baby doll. We love her to death. That dog has got hound in her, and for a Labrador Retriever, she gets down in our pool about chest deep, but I've tried to pull her in the water, and she fought me like nobody's business. I said, baby doll, you ain't full-blooded lab. Lab love the water. But this dog is precious. But you let my wife, my wife loves eating these Bridgeford, it's called smoked cow sausage sticks. When my wife opens that bag, the dog can be outside with me. And that dog will go to the door, arf, arf, arf. She wants in to mama. If I open that Bridgeford stacks up, she comes up to me because she smells it. She wants it. If you get you a pit bull dog or you get you a, a Rottweiler or something like that, Put that sucker on a big log and chain and you better hope that the tree is firmly rooted in the ground or your post is firmly in concrete and get you about a 20-ounce bloody ribeye dripping blood and hold it about a foot away from the end of that chain link and watch what that dog does. When that dog starts going, arr, 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 and starts salivating, that is me when somebody tells me they're an atheist. Because that atheist soul is that ribeye steak to me, baby. I want it. I want to work on it. I want to work on it. Son, I start doing like a dog. I start kicking dirt. I start pawing. I start, I about jerk the chain out of the ground. Why? Because I want to tell them about the love of Jesus. And that no matter what they've done... No matter what sin they committed, that when they allow God's power to come into their heart, come into their life, yes, it cleans them up, it restores them, it makes them champions, and they can be blessed beyond measure that they never knew existed. Let me, let me tell you something, brothers and sisters. God didn't call you, us, to save them. You hear me? That's God's job. He just called us to love on them and to teach them. What are you scared of? What are you afraid of? Apparently, if you're afraid, then you're not letting the power of God work through you. Because the power of God erases all fears. It erases all negative mindsets. It erases anything and everything that the devil tries to bind you with. Like my wife says, it creates a freedom inside of you that lets you turn it loose and be what God called you to be. Just like Jesus told Simon Peter to push him out off the bank. Are you ready for God to push you out? Are you ready? Are you going to let God push you out into that deeper water? Are you going to allow him to do it? Because let me tell you something. If you sit right where you're at, and you're content where you're at. The next thing you get will be complacent where you're at. And when you get complacent where you're at. When you decide in your mind. I'm not trying to tell you just to beat on you guys. I'm telling you just to challenge you because I love you. And, and, and to try to encourage you. To push you. But guys let me tell you something. Ladies. When you come to a point in your life. That you worry more about spending more time on Facebook. Than you're in God's book. When you're worried more about doing other things than you are spending time with God, it's not healthy. It's not good. When you get in God's power and get in God's presence, truly, there's no better place you could ever want to be. When you get in His presence, it's like you say to yourself, you know what, I'm in that dream and I don't want to wake up. I don't want to wake up. Are you ready to go deeper?
Because let me tell you something. God is ready to take you deeper. God is ready to take you a place that you never knew existed. But you've got to let him. You've got to allow him to work. You've got to let him work in your life. Ladies and gentlemen, I'm going to say it like this. And I'm going to wind down today. If you would, pull up the, the picture again you did of, of my boat. Don't matter which one you pull up first. Y'all see that? Can anybody tell from the color of that boat that we're Alabama Christian Tide fans? Roll Tide. Crimson and gray. A little bit of gold. Guys, I'm blessed. All right, go to the other one with the sponsor wrap on it. By the way, my wife picked those colors out. And she designed that wrap right there. She's good, isn't she? Guys, I'm blessed to have a boat with the state-of-the-art technology. I'm blessed. You see those two units sticking up right above my steering wheel on my console? I've got two more up front. It's hard to see. But all four of those units do things that work together. There's about, there's about $12,000 worth of electronics on my boat. And that's not counting the motor and all that. I can, I can pull up on a fish with those graphs on a brush pile or whatever. I can count the limbs. I can count the fish. I can literally watch what attitude, watch the fish and the behavior they're doing. <coughs> Excuse me. I can see my bait on that graph. That's how technology is now. I can see how the fish are reacting to my bait to let me know if I need to change or something. <coughs> Excuse me. I'm sorry. I don't have COVID. I promise you. I've got allergies. But all the state-of-the-art technology that you see on that boat, you don't see the power that runs it all. It's in the storage in the back back there. There's five big, five big batteries back there in the storage. I don't care how much technology I've got on that boat. If it doesn't have power, it's useless. If it doesn't have power, I can't crank up that big 250 Yamaha on the back and run 70 miles an hour down the river. Okay? If those batteries go dead, I can, I've got a built-in charger I can plug into the wall, and in a couple of hours, all five batteries are recharged. But if I charge all five batteries fully charged, and I'm out there on the water, unless I turn the switch on, no power comes through. What is the switch that turns the power of God on in your heart. It's called a relationship with Him. That's the switch that allows the power. If you don't have a relationship, He can't empower you. God can't bless what He's not in. But let me tell you something. What He's in, He will bless your doors off. Just like all that power, just like the batteries, but if I don't flip that switch, nothing works. When I put five fish in my live wheel and I turn on the marietta pumps and they're laying back there in that jacuzzi, when I get ready to call one and I go back there, if that battery goes dead and that pump shuts off, you know what happens? I get penalized for weighing in a dead fish. It costs me money. There's two things that charge your spiritual batteries. There's three things that empower you. The Holy Spirit, the relationship, is what empowers you. Praying and studying God's Word is what charges your batteries. It's what charges your spiritual batteries. If you don't read God's Word daily, and you don't pray daily, you will become spiritually dead. And the price for spiritual death will cost you more than you want to pay. Believe you me, when I open up my live well, every now and then in rough water or something, I may accidentally flip one of my pumps off. If I go back there and open that lid up, and one of my fish is about to float because they're out of oxygen, believe you me, I'm reaching for that switch, I'm reaching for whatever. I'm reaching for my TH Marine G juice. Yes, that's a sponsor plug. Amen. I pour that juice in there to them because it helps to revive them. It's like opening up the fish Bible. It gives them life. 
because I don't want penalized. I'm trying to win. And every ounce counts. Just like every soul counts in this world we're living in today. Guys, ladies, in closing, I've got a whole bunch of tackle boxes in my boat, a whole bunch of lures. The devil wants you to see the pretty material things in this life, and he wants you to worship those things. That's how he wants to kill, steal, and destroy you and stress you out and worry you to death. When I go in the bait store, there's a lot of pretty lures hanging up, and a lot of them catch fish. I'm blessed that, that Spro Bait Company is, is, is a bait company that sponsors us, and they make a ton of baits. And the way they have to mass produce them, every now and then you'll get one or two that come out of the mold, and they don't, they don't run just right. My wife will tell you, I go out to our pool in the backyard, that's me and my stepson's test tank. When I get baits, it don't matter how pretty they are, when they come in, before they go in my boat for a tournament, I go throw them in the pool, and my wife says, baby, please don't hang the liner. And I don't. I throw that bait in the water, and I watch it. If it does not look natural, like I know it's supposed to look, I will not put it in my box. In my box is stuff that's proven. Sometimes I may have three different baits or two or four or whatever that are painted the same. They may look the same. But in that, one of them may have just a little bit different action that I can't see different than the other ones. But when I tie that one on, it catches fish and the other ones don't. So when I'm having a tough tournament day and I go to change baits or change colors... Which ones do you think I always go for? I don't go for the ones that are all shiny and glitzy looking that I'm not sure of. I go for them that's got the battle scars, the teeth marks. Because I know they work. You may not be able to see, you may not be able to see the Holy Spirit. Has anybody ever seen Wi-Fi? Y'all ever seen it? Anybody ever seen it? Can you tell me what it looks like? But you know what? It's kind of like your power. Like I told them in the first service, you'll go up and complain about that power bill when it's hot and when it's cold. But soon that power goes off, you beg in the power company to get your power turned back on. Right? When that Wi-Fi goes off, you gripe because you can't get on the World Wide Web. Right? My phone's going slow. You ever thought about that? Maybe God's way of saying, hey, turn that phone off and look in my book. God has his way of doing things, brothers, sisters. But let me tell you something. You might not be able to see that Wi-Fi, but it gives you all the power you need to go a lot of places you don't need to go. Got me? Amen. But brothers and sisters, just like when I pull out those old baits that I know are proven when a tournament's on the line, Every day, go to God's tackle box where every lure in it will never let you down. You're looking at 43 years, fixing to be 43 years old, of a man that is living proof. Of when you let God work, what can happen? Guys, God could give me arms and legs right now. If it took me away from his love, I wouldn't want. I was born this way, the way God wanted me to be. And I wouldn't take it any other way. I can only do, I could go in, I could preach for weeks on this. I can only do what I do because I allow the power of God to empower me. Philippians 4.13 says, I can do all things through Christ who gives me strength. Ladies and gentlemen, don't miss your opportunity to let God bless you. Don't do it for me. Do it for God. Don't pass up your opportunity to let God bless you. Don't pass up your opportunity to let God empower you. Because I'll tell you this. When you let God's power come into your heart, in your mind, and in your life, you won't ever want to look at another bottle of alcohol 
another bottle of pain pills, another drug, another pornographic photo, nothing. You will want the power of God and His presence in your life. You will want the freedom that only He can provide. As much as I love to catch them fish, as much as I love to figure out the puzzle and put it together, you don't have any idea sometimes how I'll make 2,000 casts a day in a tournament. Doing what conditions the Bass Fishing Book 101 says do. And ain't getting a bite. And just this last tournament was a case of that in practice. And I was idling out of this creek. I remember looking up. I'm human. I said, God, I fished this lake 20, over 20 years. I grew up on it. God, I know this lake like the back of my hand. And I asked God, I said, God, why am I struggling? Why is it so hard to get bit? At that time, I had a bunch of rods on the deck because I was trying all this different stuff. God spoke to me and said, what did I bless you to do? You're a shallow water hammer. God put it in my heart. All I could see was my eight-foot dive with flipping stick. I could see a zoom mid-sized brush hog on the end of it. I knew what God was trying to tell me. I put everything up. I pulled out two flipping rods. Two different size weights, two different brush hogs. The first pocket I went into, I had 16 flipping before I left out of that pocket. I looked up and I said, Lord, sometimes you got to beat me over the head because I'm hard-headed. But I'll listen. Listen to God this morning. Obey Him. Guys, praise team, if you come on up, I want to challenge you this morning. Let God empower you. But the only way to receive that power, first of all, is a relationship through His Son, Jesus Christ. If you don't have that relationship, like I said, much as I love catching them fish, there's one thing I love more outside of my wife. And that's seeing a soul come and say, I want Jesus. I want that relationship. This altar is wide open, guys. You see me walking around on hips. God blessed you with two long legs. God left you with two long legs. Don't look at me and say, well, I'm afraid what somebody's going to say or what somebody's going to see. Because I tell you right now, what we want to do with you is celebrate with you. We're not going to make fun of you and we're not going to point a finger, but we're going to celebrate with you. Be that leader. Be that ignition that starts a blaze.